what a departure with your second title at Fun Train from what you did before, your hit, The Exorcist Legion VR. How'd you make the choice to do something as different and is as different a style as you're doing with Tarzan. We go with whatever brands or whatever kind of intellectual property that we think is exciting or that might excite people. So what will make VR gamers or you know the VR audience, what will excite them or get them, get more people into VR. And so we knew that obviously The Exorcist is a pretty wide reaching brand, but Tarzan is known around the world. He's kind of one of the first superheroes actually. Even though he's an older character, there's probably no country on earth where someone does not know who Tarzan is. I mean, he's in every language. And at some point in everyone's life, you know, at some point in their young life, they've grabbed a clothesline or a rope or a vine or something and said, look, I'm Tarzan. And they felt like they were swinging like Tarzan. So that was an indicator to me that it's a pretty ubiquitous brand and I thought it would be good for VR. So we found a great team who also was as passionate about it as we were. I named Stonepunk Studios. And, and really... We don't just do horror, we do fantasy, we do science. Our next, our third title is a science fiction title that we're really excited about. We cross many different categories. I'm excited um, about this one. I'll be excited to see the sci-fi title. What was that like for you working with the Edgar Rice Burroughs team? Did you already know them from your work as a filmmaker or were they a new team for you? We didn't know them. You know, we sought them out and we're now great friends, but they're really, they're really interesting team and they are sort of the curators or the cultivators of this Tarzan brand and the mythology. I mean, obviously they are experts in everything Tarzan and they've been so generous with the library. It's like going to the British Museum when you step into the offices of Edgar Rice Burroughs Incorporated. They're just comics and lunch boxes and figurines and clothing and you name it, all this Tarzan merchandise, but also this deep history. And they're actually, their offices are actually in the offices of Edgar Rice Burroughs' original office in Tarzana, California. I just think it's so crazy that there's a city named after this character. I mean, that's like, it's like having Superman City or something like that, or Batman City. It's really, but anyway, they're great. They've been incredibly kind and incredibly accommodating, and they love the game as much as we do, so. I'm going to do a shameless plug here because you have this amazing video on your website that shows the offices of the Edgar Rice Burroughs team. Right, and they talk right. a little bit about the new game. So let's be sure and give the link where people can find out more before we continue and get a look at the game itself. Where do they find sure. out more about Tarzan VR? Well, you can go to tarzanvirtualreality.com or funtrainvr.com and we have links to the game. Of course, the big question is, we put the headset on. We're going to play Tarzan VR. What do we experience and where are we? Sure. It's set in the jungle. That's where Tarzan, that's where Tarzan <laughs> lives. The game actually starts out, you're on something that we've kind of created to service the game, which is basically what we call Tarzan Island. It's a, kind of a safe zone where Tarzan can hang out. It's actually Tarzan's home tree house is there. Items that he's collected throughout his life, you can sort of interact with and discover. We've structured this game as far as, a, well, Tarzan is a big comic book sort of hero and comic books going back a long time. So what we actually have created is episodes that are based on comic book issues. So the story that we're telling is a story told over three comic book issues. And the comic books themselves are actually in Tarzan's treehouse in VR. So you start in the treehouse, but to launch into the actual story, you actually select a comic book out of Tarzan's comic book collection of Tarzan comics. I know it's a little, it's a little strange, but <laughs> it's fun. And you open the comic book and you get transported into the pages of a comic book. The development team, Stonepunk, came out, out of like the World of Warcraft team from, I think they were for like almost 10 years at World of Warcraft. So they uh, created this like very visual cell shaded comic book style of game. And it sort of fit perfectly with this idea of going into the pages of a comic. So you can do everything that you would expect Tarzan to do in the jungle, a swing, swim, climb, fight evildoers in the jungle and explore sort of the natural wonder of the jungle. So those are kind of the five pillars of our gameplay. What were the physics involved? So many mm. times people say with VR, ooh, I have to be careful not to get anybody sick, but we can swim right. on the vines, we can swim, we've got bubbles over our heads and fish mm. around us, and you don't feel strange. How did they accomplish that? 
Well, swinging, we knew that Tarzan must swing. We knew that we had to really pull off swinging convincingly. But also one of our key challenges was making sure, like you said, that people did not get motion sickness. We were able to find it a comfortable experience, but also an exciting experience. So we spent the first phase of production was almost two months of doing nothing but swinging different kinds of swinging mechanics and different kinds of swinging prototypes in one particular case you actually had to leap from vine to vine to grab in another case the vines would kind of come to you so you could grab them so you didn't have to like reach but we wanted it we, we knew we needed to split the difference and make it something that did not cause motion sickness but was also easy to learn how to do but difficult to master so we want it. We want to make sure that people feel like they've actually accomplished something when there's swinging across a ravine and going from vine to vine, hand over hand. We wanted to make it feel rewarding. We actually have comfort settings built into the game, which allow you, if you're one of those people that easily gets easily sick, although it's not likely to happen, you could turn on a feature that will sort of give you tunnel vision while you're swinging. So that will help if you're the kind of person that gets easily ocean sick. I like that a lot. My husband's the one who can put on the quest and take the roller coaster, but I'm the one who kind of goes like so. So I really like the uh, setting. Yeah. What about the humor that you have in here? I love the toucan. I love the radio that's really annoying through different parts. How'd you make that decision to include these features? You think the radio is annoying? I kind of do too, but uh, it's kind of <laughs> fun. It's kind of fun as well. The radio is a narrative device. It gets some of our story elements delivered via the radio. And then other times it's atmospheric. And we actually have a, another podcaster, Anthony of this, of the VR podcast, that is actually the voice of the radio from time to time when we don't have the villains talking. But the humor in the game sort of evolved. You know, Tarzan is a, it's a lighthearted adventure. So we didn't want everything to be so like serious and grim and li and it is life and death in parts, but also we know we needed some levity and the Toucan is actually, and I was corrected by some Tarzan fans. He's actually an African hornbill. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> don't put him fans because Tarzan fans don't like that. He's an African hornbill. We call him Barnaby internally. He's just the pet in a Tarzan's treehouse. That character sort of evolved into a more humorous character over time. We wanted him to be an instructional character to teach you how to do certain things, like how to visit your record player in your treehouse, or how to eat fruit, or how to interact with the world, or where your weapons rack is, or where your training dummy is. That was his intention. But over time, we cast him, an actor by the name of Brian Roberts to play that part. And we found that he had a real sort of aptitude for this comedic timing. So we, we ended up writing to that and really played to his strengths. And it does really add a unique color to the game, which we're really, we're really proud of that character. I laughed out loud a couple of times listening to what he had to say. That was really kind of fun. He, also, he has hundreds of phrases. I mean, and they're randomized. And he'll sometimes he'll just comment on something or tell a joke or there are certain ways that you can interact with him that I don't want to spoil, but there are surprises with that character for your players to discover. So. Speaking of things we don't want to spoil, I like that mm -hmm. you have certain points we have to hit, but my gaming experience isn't going to be the same as anyone else's because we can explore. Is right. there anything you might like to tell me without spoiling what it is that I might want to look for? Maybe an Easter egg or something, maybe just a hint of some place I might want to explore that might be off the beaten path in Tarzan VR. Oh, sure. Well, yeah. So as you know, we have these hidden records that are, there's these old Tarzan radio dramas from the 40s and 50s that you can find hidden throughout. If you kind of go off the beaten path and explore in the jungle, you'll occasionally come across these vinyl records that once you interact with them, they'll zip off you know, and then they'll go back and they'll, they're collected in your treehouse after you return to Tarzan Island. But those are hidden in some interesting places. And one in particular, I guess, this isn't really a spoiler because it, it's challenging to find it. But if you've played the game, you'll understand. But there's a large waterfall that you have to jump off midway through episode one. There's a crocodile, and, and, I, and I don't think I'm spoiling this for too many people. There's a crocodile waiting for you. But if you escape that crocodile and then you walk around the side of the waterfall, and go up into the hillside, there's another skull cave up there. It's like a skull carved out of stone. And inside that is one of the hidden records. And we notice not a lot of people find that, but it's there for people who really want to be uh, inquisitive and 
really poke around in places where we didn't intend them to go. There's also on top of Tarzan, there's a way to get to the very tip top of Tarzan Island. There's a secret up there as well. So those are my two hints. Special feature for anybody that listens to this podcast. And I don't think we found yeah. anything here. You were telling me previously as you were developing the Tarzan game that it was turning out even better than you envisioned. What's one favorite story that you'd like to share about that? One moment when, whoa, this is great. I think what we discovered well, I think developing VR is always changing, right? I mean, and the mechanics and the sort of the rules of VR is always evolving. And what we found with Tarzan was when Tarzan started out more of like exploration and kind of puzzle solving, puzzles the wrong word, but sort of obstacles and challenges that you have to overcome. But what we found out is uh, the combat, like sort of rum, like this sort of fist fighting combat mechanic became, it was a lot more fun than we intended it to be a small part, but we had such a good time doing it that we expanded on that. And that was a really enjoyable part of the game development. I mean, Stonepunk came up with this combat mechanic and this kind of these ragdoll physics of this like cartoon style fighting, but it, it, it really is rewarding. And so we kind of leaned into that more and, and it became more sort of an action adventure kind of a game as opposed to just more exploration. So there's all kinds of things that you can do in order to fight these bad guys. You can hit them in the head with a coconut or you can grab them with one, you know, you can throw them over your, grab them with two ends and throw them over your shoulder, or you can swing from a vine and, and sort of rock it down from a vine and take them out. Or you can even trick them into, you know, one guy shooting rockets. You can actually trick them into one guy walking in front of the rocket launcher and, you know, taking his buddy out. There's even a grenade, uh, I don't know, what's the word? The a person who throws grenades. Grenadier? Is that the military I, term? I can't remember. I, I'm not sure. Let's call him the grenade launcher. <laughs> okay. But anyway, you, there's a hidden baseball bat that you find it in the, the bad guy's camp. You can actually knock those grenades back like you're playing a game of baseball back to the enemy. So there's a lot of fun things that we discovered that weren't in the initial objective, but, but we think makes the game a lot more satisfying and, and more fun and, and more accessible for casual players. You told me before as well about the times in Exorcist Legion VR when even as the creator, it startled the daylights out of you. What are the times when in Tarzan you play it and you think, whoa, this is cool. So those moments sort of that still give you the chills or still get, yeah, well, there's a part of the game that I find quite scary and I don't want to ruin this for people either, but there's, if you swim on Tarzan Island, you can swim out into the ocean. But if you swim too far and too deep into the ocean, there is something, a surprise waiting for you. It's unsettling. And the first time I did that, I was, and subsequent times I get a little, I don't like deep water. I don't like the unknown, so looking into the murky depth of the ocean. That's a fun moment. Also, just there's a few visual moments in the game, in particular in episode one, when you're, you first arrived in the jungle and you walk to this sort of cave, this rock entrance, and you see the sunlight streaming through the trees and the, and the birds, the African hornbills flying by, and the music kind of swells. And there's, there's a few kind of, what I think are sublime moments of just natural wonder, which I really appreciate in the game. We should point out that you're getting pretty much rave reviews on the music, on the artwork, it looks amazing. And I personally like the lion a lot, who is in episode two. Numa, yeah, that's Numa the lion. So that's one of the things, episode three, which is currently in the beta right now, but episode three also has an animal that you can call to. We have this thing called Call of the Wild, where Tarzan can call, and the lion or the creature in episode three, they come to your aid, and basically they become your animal companion and fighter for you for a while. It is neat. I see that you've got a third episode coming out. You just said you have it in beta, but at some points it says you have five episodes at some three, which is, is this? Yeah, where, where did you, yeah. So the five episodes, what we found was that our model is we tend to do more short form, lower price, short form VR adventures so that you can do an episode in a single VR session. Yeah. You know, so we don't do two, like, you know, hour, two hour, three hour episodes because the people we found that, people's batteries run out on their headsets or they don't really want to be in VR for that long. So our playtime is based on the average LinkedIn headset of general sort of VR players. And what we found 
We were a five episode game originally, but what we found was our individual episodes were getting longer. So episodes one, two, and three are much longer and more robust than we had initially intended because it just it just worked. You know, it just felt like this is a good good length. So what we did was we reduced from a five episode to a three episode work. And then we found that it was a lot more sort of satisfying to be in each episode a little bit longer than what was initially planned. That brings up what I'd meant to ask you before about what did and did not work. It sounds like keeping in mind the time and the player's attention span works really well. What do you find does not work as well when you're telling a story in VR versus what works great? What we have discovered is that players, if, if there's something in the world that seems like you can interact with it, you should be able to. You should be able to pick it up. There's nothing worse than seeing something in the world, like say, for example, it'd be just a coconut that's laying there. If the co- if you cannot pick the coconut up and interact with that coconut, in our case, we can break the coconut in half and eat, eat the coconuts. But if, if you can't interact with everything you, you come across in the world, then sort of that immersion is broken. So we know that that doesn't work well in VR if there's only certain things you can interact with and there's certain things you can't. In, an, in a perfect world, everything you see, you should be able to interact with. Now, we haven't fully accomplished that in Tarzan, but we're getting closer with every title we, we make. So, And you have to make some choices on maybe it would be great to have an item in there, but if you can't interact with it, what's the point? Otherwise, it's just a game. And the thing about VR is it needs to be immersive and interactive as much as possible. So we know that that doesn't work. What does work, I think these big visual wow moments that you can't get in flat screen gaming. And we try to lean into those. Anything that has to do with scale or, I mean, I just brought up, well, episode two, you're climbing the cliffs of this mountain. And at a certain point, you grab onto a piece of machinery, which is almost like a a conveyor belt or like a zip line. And it's taking you up the side of a cliff. That's the kind of thing that you can't do. You can't get this feeling of looking down and seeing distance and, and this feeling of danger. And You can't get that in games. You can't really get that in films. It's almost like that IMAX experience when you see IMAX for the first time, that sort of that feeling in your stomach, unease, but also exhilaration. There's more moments to be found like that in VR. And every time we see an opportunity for those, we really lean in because they are what makes VR special. I get the impression you are having a blast creating VR. (laughs) It's hard. Let me tell you, it's hard. And it's always changing. It's like trying to trying to hit a a moving target sometimes, because I'll tell you something. So Tarzan is coming to Oculus Quest. When we first started Tarzan, there was no such thing as Oculus Quest. We started development of Tarzan in January of 2019, and then Quest didn't come out until May of 2019, and no one really knew if it was going to be a big hit. I mean, obviously we were developing Exorcist for Quest, but we didn't know if it was going to be feel be like, you know, the gear VR situation where it doesn't really evolve into much. Um, so we didn't really plan for Quest, Tarzan on Quest, but once Quest came out in May, we saw that, oh, we have to be on this platform. So we began pivoting to make sure that we satisfied that market eventually. And that's what's coming up soon. But the hardest thing about this is keeping your finger on the pulse of the technology and and where it will be heading in the future. I mean, I'd love to know what's happening with PlayStation VR in 2022. You know, these are kind of big unknowns and, but we, we do our best to be light on our feet and the teams we work with are nimble and flexible and can address any new technology that may evolve between now and when we actually ship a game. Do you know yet a date when that's coming to Oculus Quest? I have a general date. It will be, let me say the first half of next year. Okay, I'll be good. Guess what kind yeah. of a headset I have. <laughs> that's why I asked oh, about yeah. you said Oculus oh, Quest. Yeah. Absolutely. And we have a Quest title that's a, that's a Quest first title that has not been announced yet. That'll be coming out in October of next year, more or less. That's our goal. And then we have some things cooking on Exorcist, which I don't really... I can't really get into yet because I don't know, but things are things are happening with that title as well. So it's exciting times. I'll be good. But what I will ask you is you referenced, as we started, a science fiction game you're working on. What can you tell me about it? I can't tell you much about it because we have this whole thing where we make a public announcement and we did the, 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 you know, the publicity team. and But we're working closely with Oculus on this one. 
and it's a title that everybody i don't want to be like too coy and be like oh you know like it's a title you know okay a title you love and it's um a title that we have a very talented team working on based in the uk they actually did the port all the, the oculus quest ports for we're on the oculus quest porting team for super hot so and we have a, a writer on board this project who is a former you know did some time on alien isolation and, and did some time at valve and actually was one of the many writers on half-life alex so we got a really crack team and this is and i'll let you know we'll have to do another one of these interviews as soon as i we announce this publicly but that's an exciting title and that's oh. going to be for fourth quarter of next year I hate to be that guy that always says like, oh, we got something coming, we can't. I'm usually not that, but I just, I have to follow sort of an order of operations on, on our. Yeah, and legally and business-wise, you can't tell me everything that I might like to know, but you know. Wish I could, I would get so excited. <laughs> this will be yeah. exciting. I will ask though, what do you yeah. consider one of the most exciting ways that you've grown as a creator from working on Tarzan VR? Okay. The number one, I mean, this comes up every day and I think about this a lot and I'm not a, you know, I'm not a, we, we collaborate. So learning how to collaborate and learning how to give and take with other creatives, I think is something that is not a skill you just wake up with. I think that you have to cultivate that talent to know when to compromise and know with what you want versus what the experts, you know, the creative experts in the case of Stonepunk, you know, Stonepunk had some very clear, a clear vision on certain items in Tarzan, like the comic book interstitials that come up on screen in between certain scenes. That's something that they visualized and we I didn't necessarily agree with them in the beginning, but I realized it actually makes the game much better. So that ability creatively, I think the ability to come to see someone, another creative's perspective and adapt and then, you know, sort of mold your, or, or combine your, your vision with theirs is, is, is really valuable because nobody can do this alone. It takes a team and a team of kind of really out of the box thinkers. The ability to creatively collaborate is a skill that you need to continually cultivate. I have been trying to do that and so far it's working. Douglas, thank you for your time today. Thank you, Dot. That was, this was nice. It was nice to see you. Tarzan's on Steam. Episodes one and two are currently in release on Steam. Episode three is coming soon. We are, we will be on PlayStation VR and we're coming to Oculus Quest. <laughs>